Well, hello, and thank you for joining us again for our Bible study this week. I am Pastor Jason Hughes, and this is Revelation Letters from the End of the World. I hope you're having a great week. I hope you're enjoying uh, the beginning of what we hope is cooler weather. Uh, We certainly have our minds on those who are dealing with uh, dangerous weather uh, in our country, and uh, really all over the world there's things happening, but... um, Certainly, uh, all the more reason that we are learning from God's Word about what His plan is for the end of the world, for the end of this age. Well, I hope that um, uh, you've had a chance to read ahead, and I hope that uh, you're learning as we go through this amazing book. Uh, My prayer is that um, in some way, shape, or form, this ministry would help you in your relationship with God. That's truly my desire. And uh, for those of you who are interested in um, this book and this study, I've heard some really great feedback and, um, you know, just really humbling that the Lord could use this in your life, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I've heard of people um, all across the, the country that are joining in, and um, that's really encouraging. Where today, we continue in the Great Tribulation, um, the seven-year period It depends how you look at it, right? Uh, There's seven years of tribulation. Some people call the last three and a half years the Great Tribulation. Nevertheless, we're at the beginning half of that seven-year period, and today we're looking at the end of chapter 6. Last time, as a review, we talked about the possible viewpoints of Revelation, particularly about the timing or the sequencing of the Second Coming, the tribulation, and the rapture. And I try to be very clear about my perspective, um, my particular viewpoint, so that you kind of understand how I was looking at at the remaining, uh, the remaining rather, uh, scriptures in in the book. Uh, That's always important for you to have that on the front of your mind. If you haven't uh, seen that lesson, you can go back to lesson nine and watch that and really get a crash course on eschatology, the study of the end times. Today we continue in uh, the tribulation and looking. we're going to be looking specifically at the uh, remaining seals. But before we do, I want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask that He would bless our time together. Dear Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus and we praise you, we love you, we thank you. We ask for your help now as we draw close to you in your word. Bless these folks and reward them for their diligence and for their heart to spend time with you. Father, guide us and protect us from error and uh, help us to be encouraged uh, by the promises of your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we have a lot to get through today. Um, One of the things that I wanted to focus on, aside from uh, Revelation 6, 9 through 17, is talking a little more about the sequencing of the tribulation. But first, here's another encouraging verse uh, for those of you who agree that the Bible supports a pre-tribulational rapture. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10, where the Apostle Paul writes, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And that's a wonderful promise. Uh, It reminds me of to live as Christ, to die as gain. It reminds me of Romans 8, 1. There is no Therefore, now there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so, this is just one more verse that supports a pre-tribulational rapture. All right, let's talk about some of the chronologies. When, when you're looking at Revelation and you're trying to make sense of this seal, trumpet, bowl business of judgment, how, how do these things fit together? Or is it talking about a sequential order of events, or is there another way to view the book of Revelation? Well, I've already 
spoken to this briefly, and I told you that I really have uh, agree with a telescopic perspective, and I want to articulate that a little better now. Here is three different uh, possibilities to view the judgments. For those of you who are very new to Revelation, the judgments include seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. So look at the first uh, row. One possibility is to see all of these things happening happening at once. And the book or the genre just repeats the same events with intensifying um, elements or descriptions. In other words, it's, it's repeating what is happening to show how um, these things really intensify to, to the end. The, the second way of looking at it is that these things are consecutive uh, judgments. 777, 21 in total, happening one after another after another. And the final way is the telescopic argument. Uh, and what, what it really seems in this chart, Dr. Aiken describes it well, it seems that it begins with the seals, We've already seen that Christ is breaking the seals. And as he breaks one through six, when he reaches the seventh seal, within that seventh seal contains the seven trumpets, the next series of judgments. And as the trumpets are blown, the seventh trumpet contains the actual seven bowls of judgment. And yes, they get more intense with each progression, but um, it makes a lot more sense with the the text when you see that um, the the seventh in the series actually includes and explains uh, the next form of judgment. Now that that might be confusing, but I hopefully we'll see that a little uh, more clearly as we study through them. I, I just want to read this uh, to reemphasize this before we move forward. He writes, The telescopic arrangement has the seventh seal introducing the trumpet series and being explained by it. So the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets and it explains them. And the seventh trumpet introduces the bowl series and is explained by it. So, if you just think about the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet actually containing the next seven forms of judgment, uh, you'll be on track. Now, I know that it's confusing, but look at the chart. Read it over again. Uh, thank, thankfully, we have the pause button, and uh, I hope that that will become more clear as we walk through this. Overall, the bigger picture is something that I think is incredibly helpful because you know it's enough to deal with the symbolism but when we're trying to understand how all these events work together we really need a solid timeline and so this is also uh, a chart from Dr. Aiken in his commentary from the Christ-centered exposition series and I think that this is the most helpful commentary uh, and the most helpful chart concerning the timeline that I've found Let's see if I can use my mouse here and show you. So here we are in the present age, and if we um, look at the scripture and we believe that there will be a rapture before the tribulation begins, of course, we know that uh, from key text, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, I read to you that he'll protect us from wrath, and Revelation 3.10 says that he will protect us from the hour of trial So, let's say the rapture occurs. It occurs before the seals are broken. And you can make an argument that directly after the rapture, Christ himself breaks the first seal of the tribulation. Now, it's very interesting that, um, in a way, uh, he has the actual first half of the tribulation divided among the first 
three seals. So the first year would be the white horse. That means as soon as the rapture takes place and the tribulation begins, the Antichrist uh, begins his work or comes to power or uh, becomes known in the world. And then, of course, we read that the red horseman represents um, a great war that will follow all his deception uh, of peace. Remember, he comes forward uh, conquering, and we know from other passages like Daniel 9 that he really is about to um, introduce unprecedented peace, but it's all a farce. Uh, it, it fades, and it fades to the most destructive warfare in human history. A lot of buzz about this, particularly right now, with all that's happening in the Middle East and the Abrahamic Accords, uh, this this uh, historic peace between the uh, UAE and Israel, uh, also Bahrain, possibly uh, Kosovo and, and Serbia, uh, Muslim nations, uh, Kosovo, I believe, the Muslim predominant nation, uh, you know, uh, that's just uh, reached a peace agreement. Of course, uh, our president has uh, already been nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I guess without getting into some of the details, because I'm sure that raises a lot of questions for you, I think what we can say is that it's possible that these Middle East peace arrangements are setting the roadmap for what we learn about in Daniel 9.27, that the Antichrist uh, makes a covenant with many. Um, doesn't mean that I think any particular person is the Antichrist. It just means that we're, we're a step closer towards a reality. Um, and, and that's really the way that prophecy uh, works, um, particularly in the last 70 years uh, from the regathering of Israel, um, you know, little by little, um, the world stage has shifted. And just for by example, you know, before 1940s, you know, no one could imagine that there would be a, a, a Jewish state again. And of course, uh, there was. In 1948, Israel was uh, created again. And, um, you know, when you look at the Six-Day War or other events, uh, you know, it seem, things seem so improbable, improbable rather, but slowly and surely, unprecedented, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that things that didn't seem likely end up taking place. And, uh, you know, we've seen some of those shifts uh, in the past three years with... Uh, Israel um, having its capital, Jerusalem, identified. Um, no one thought that peace with the UAE would be possible. No one thought that the stalemate with the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis would ever make inroads. But slowly but surely, things are changing. I guess that's my point. Um, it seems like we're getting a step closer towards a, a reality where um, everything is set for these things to begin. Uh, as we move forward, I'll continue to give you teasers. I mean, I think since you've been faithful thus far to bear with me, um, I think we certainly are getting closer to a time in history where the things that need to be accomplished to fulfill all the prophecies regarding this end time will be set. Um, Israel certainly was a huge one. Um, after 2,000 years, uh, this Israel that was destroyed was reformed. Um, and there's a lot of other things. Uh, Daniel says knowledge will increase. People will travel to and fro. Uh, the Lord says the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. There's a lot. If you're looking for like uh, requirements. A lot of those have been fulfilled, and a lot of things seem to be happening with greater intensity and greater frequency. And when you look at the last three years, for example, a lot of things, so many things have happened that we, we almost forget how much has happened because of our 
constantly refreshing news cycle. So I do think we are getting closer to this time. Um, probably the most uh, profound argument for us getting closer to the end times is just the, the level of debauchery and evil in the world, where evil is called good and good is called evil. Um, it reminds me of um, some of the passages, passages in Timothy where we see kind of qualifiers We've already talked about uh, Jesus referring to the end times would be just like the generations of Noah. Violence in the heart of men, upheaval, hate, uh, rebellion, uh, dismissal of authority, etc. Now, I'm not alone in that. Uh, in fact, a recent survey done um, amongst S Southern Baptist pastors, 90% of them believe we are getting closer to the end times. But of course, uh, the Bible makes it very clear that no one knows the hour, and so we're never going to speculate on when this could happen. I think we've already reviewed the imminency of Christ um, returning for the church, which means it could happen at any minute. Um, and so a chart like this, to get back on track, is, is very helpful. You see that we've already talked about the first, second, third, and fourth seal. That's Antichrist, war, famine, death. And this marks the three and a half year point. And this is exactly when the Antichrist will step forward and um, you know, either the covenant will have already been made, the covenant with many, and he will break it, or uh, it just depends on your viewpoint there. But from that moment on, we move from the tribulation to the great tribulation. And you'll see as we move forward that um, each of these segments are, are divided up containing trumpets and bowls. Um, so you can see, in a sense, that telescopic approach. Um, of course, all this ends when the Battle of Armageddon and the Second Coming of Christ in Revelation 19, 11. And then, um, of course, we have the Millennial Reign, we have the Great White Throne Judgment and Satan's Final Rebellion, and then we have Eternity, which is covered in the last chapters of Revelation. Now, we'll go over this chart uh, in a lot more detail, but I hope that it helps you to kind of see exactly how all this is laid out. Alright, let's turn to the text. Revelation 6, 9-17 through 17. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until your judge, excuse me, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So first off, we see in the last half of chapter 6, uh, martyrs assured under the altar. Here's an artist uh, depiction of what John has described. It's very a uh, unique visual in the book of Revelation. And we're going to talk a lot about these martyrs uh, right now. Um, they're pictured under the altar, and there's a lot of questions that come up when you're thinking through this. Is the blood of the martyrs a pleasing sacrifice to God? Um, you know, why are they pictured under the altar? Uh, remember, the church of Smyrna was encouraged by the Lord Jesus. Uh, they were dealing with incredible persecution, and um, many martyrs were dying for their faith in the Lord Jesus, and Jesus promised them, encouraged them, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, some scholars debate, is this the altar of incense, where we see uh, the prayers of the saints gathered, or is this the, the altar of the burnt offerings? Um, and really, it's not very clear. Uh, some scholars 
say that the text suggests both, but what's the point? The point is that it's not that important which author it is. Um, remember, uh, Revelation is so enticing, it's very easy to get sucked into the details and try to figure things out that aren't there. In other words, the text doesn't give you the exact meaning. Um, and that's where you have to be careful um, because you can very easily begin to speculate. Uh, however, if you just step back a little bit and you say, okay, what is the main idea? Uh, wh what is the main thing that God is conveying to us in this section? Then I think it becomes a little more easy uh, to manage. Why are they there? Why would God show us the martyrs there? Well, I think one of the reasons is, is just for encouragement. Encouragement for all the Christians who are facing persecution today. Um, now, firstly, let's recognize all of our many brothers and sisters who are regularly facing the threat of death in uh, you know, hidden or uh, secretive churches, underground churches, house churches, in closed countries that are very, very um, much enemies of the Lord and the gospel. Um, we hear lots of stories all the time about missionaries. Um, and I have some incredible stories that I've, I've learned through colleagues in the year uh, throughout the years, uh, one that comes to mind briefly is that uh, one of my Greek professors was, has been a regular um, missionary to Ethiopia for probably 25 years now. Him and his wife did great work there. She's passed. He continues to. But um, it's a very dangerous place. Uh, and they were there with a tribe working, uh, teaching the gospel. And um, these young people were so excited about their faith that they actually went uh, to another tribe that was predominantly Muslim and began witnessing to them. And, of course, it, in, it infuriated the Muslim uh, folks that lived there. And some of them murdered one of the young boys who um, had come and brought them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's a long story, but what happened is the Christian tribe continued to uh, began to minister to the murderer of this young man. Uh, they would bring him clothes and food in jail. He was arrested um, over there, at least at that time. This may have been 10 years ago. Uh, when you're in jail there, people either bring you supplies from the outside or you, you don't survive. But how amazing that the very Christians who are grieving the young man who was murdered were the ones bringing and caring for um, this uh, young man who had made such a horrible mistake. Uh, long story short, this young man was so moved by this outstanding radical love that he began to read the Bible and he was saved and believe it or not, he became a Christian uh, pastor himself. He uh, was released from prison uh, because of his uh, incredible transformation and uh, is now also a minister of reconciliation for the Lord Jesus. You know, amazing things happen on the mission field. And um, I, I really desire that our church family understand that our mission field is right here and I think the more we get that in our hearts and minds the more amazing things we're going to see happen because we're going to be empowered to step out in faith in our own community. Well how encouraging is it to know that um, the blood of the martyrs is not forgotten. It's not going to be overlooked. God is very very aware of the sacrifice that the saints have made uh, for His glory and His ministry. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Interesting how they, they pray, right? How long, O oh Lord, will you allow, um, you know, what's the exact words there? It says, How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And the question is, is this a Christian prayer? I mean, is this really? Um, 
the martyrs asking for vengeance. And a lot of people find that, that that's very difficult for them to kind of reconcile because it seems much more of an Old Testament practice like eye for an eye, lex talionis, or um, imprecatory psalms where you see the psalmist actually pray that judgment would fall on their enemies. But didn't Jesus change everything with the new covenant and aren't we supposed to pray for our enemies? We're well, sure we are. This is not so much about personal revenge as it is about public justice. You see, a lot of people have a hard time dealing with this because they make it about uh, themselves instead of about God's glory. This is literally about God's name being vindicated to show that He is righteous. And while it may have seemed for a short time that evil was taking place and not being judged, Oh, you better believe it is going to be judged, and true justice will be enacted, and God's glorious righteousness will be vindicated. So we see texts like that, that, that you know, uh, where it seems that God is overlooking the sins of David or the Old Testament saints. He's not. Um, he certainly will have his uh, righteousness vindicated in those two. He didn't pass over them. He just delayed the judgment of them. And um, it's a really much broader question, and we could certainly talk about this for hours, uh, particularly in the problems in the, the lukewarm, watered-down church of today. Um, let's press forward. I thought about this. This is, um, imagine that you're under the teaching of, of Christ. Say you're on the Sea of Galilee, and he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents, and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is Christ himself teaching about the end times, um, obviously from Mark uh, chapter 13 here. But there's a, there's a lot of key things in this particular part of his teaching that are, that are really applicable to Revelation 6. Uh, this, this idea of not letting anyone deceive you. Uh, makes me think of the Antichrist, the rumors of wars, um, the earthquakes and famines, which we'll see in the sixth seal in a minute, uh, the betrayal, the rebellion, the hate, the persecution, and the encouragement for those who stand against the persecution. Well, of course, Romans twelve nineteen, uh, the Lord says that vengeance is mine. I will repay. There's a wonderful comfort in that fact that no matter what wrongdoing or injustice, seeming injustice occurs on the planet at any given time, uh, God's scales always balance. And, um, you know, we love everyone and we abhor what is evil. We hate sin. And we can love and pray for those who hurt us or those who do unthinkable things. We can pray that God will, will save them. Um, but in the end, we also can celebrate when God um, exacts justice because it really is about His character and the glorious future that He has prepared. A lot of questions are about who are these martyrs? Are these tribulation martyrs? Are these all martyrs? Um, G.K. Beale even suggests that it's possible that these martyrs are uh, really a representation of a broader category of suffering for the sake of your faith. He admits that per, sure, certainly literal martyrs may be in mind. Um, but he says, more likely, slain is a metaphor 
for those who actually suffer for the sake of their faith? Um, it's an interesting question. You and I suffer slight persecutions. I think um, the more engaged you are in ministry, the, the greater severity of persecutions you may experience. Um, but of course, our culture is changing quickly, and, and it's very clear that America is much more anti-Christian today than it was. Uh, you know, we are almost in a completely different reality from 50 years ago. Um, and so I do think that we can be comforted that God's going to reward anyone who suffers uh, in faith. Um, remember uh, Hebrews 11:6. He is a just rewarder of those who seek him. Um, but, of course, those who suffer the most are going to be rewarded the most. And, you know, our history, the history of the church is just filled with amazingly brave men and women who have died for their faith. In the Protestant Reformation, um, when men and women were just trying to get back to the scripture and 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 believe God's word instead of the authority of the church, uh, which at the time was was you know had centuries of abuse uh, on its record. Um, they were horribly mistreated, burned at the stake. Some of the Anabaptists, um, their husbands were um, burnt at the stake, and their wives were put in bags and thrown in the river, all because they believed in baptism by immersion. I mean. If you have a chance and you're interested, do some reading about the Protestant Reformation and and look at Wycliffe and John Huss and um, Hubmeyer. There's so many that um, brave people that died for their faith. And of course, you can trace that all the way back. And we don't need to be so removed from it because there are people even today. I read a story um, in one of the commentaries about four children that would not renounce their faith in Jesus uh, when ISIS members were threatening to kill them and they they would not uh, believe um, Islam they they said that you know Jesus loves us and we're not going to uh, f fall away from from our belief in him and and they were killed very tragically but they are with their Lord now and that is a beautiful thought uh, how precious the, the the pure love of a child loving Jesus, um, they will be rewarded. You better believe it. God is just and He is good, and they will be rewarded. There's so much to talk about. Uh, forgive me if I get off on uh, tangents, but um, this is a great quote. Faithfulness to God's word may involve sacrifice, but such a sacrifice is a sweet aroma in the nostrils of our God. Um, he is pleased, and, and we'll talk a little more in a second about um, what exactly might be the ultimate purpose for all this martyrdom. Um, one reason I'll say right now is that, um, uh, as Tertullian said, and we talked about back in Revelation 2 in the Church of Smyrna, uh, you know, blood is the very seed of the church. Think about it. All of those who died for their faith in the first century, starting with the apostles, with the exception of John, um, but he suffered great persecution, right, as a prisoner on Patmos when he's writing this book. Um, all the first century Christians that died under the persecution of Nero, um, you know, that only propelled the truth. Because people said, you know what? Nobody would be stupid enough to die for a lie. These people really believed they must be telling the truth. And so where the enemy has tried to stomp out the church or destroy the word of God, it has only served to propel it uh, or uh, ignite it in really great ways all throughout church history. So this is um, part of the chapter that I thought was really meaty. Uh, it says that they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which which, which they hailed. And, um, you know, we have to think about this very carefully. We live in a world now where 
the most loving thing we could do is to help introduce people to God by sharing the good news of the gospel, the best news we've ever heard that has totally transformed us and transformed our future destiny. And yet the world treats that act of love as it's some type of hateful bigotry judgmentalism. If that's not the perfect example of the times we live in, where so many people are championing and virtue signaling, celebrating all the things that are evil, like think about the degradation of marriage, of sexuality, um, of, you know, now, amazingly, you have people that are out being activists for pedophilia. Like, how sick can you get? And, 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 and you've got people, very secular-minded, lost people, granted, but they are actually out there, uh, you know, fighting through all types of political activism for their right to love children. You know, horrible, right? Unbelievable that that would happen in our country. But, but of course, this is just the bed we've made for ourselves. This is the fruit of things that have been sown for the last 50 years when, as God has systematically been removed from our public life. I, I, I want to stop. <laughs> what I want to say is that we live in a world now where it's celebrated to champion sin, things that God will uh, wrathfully judge, and it's actually condemned to do the most loving thing, which is to share Christ with others. Uh, I think that should set the stage in your mind for, wow, how much longer before we are physically persecuted for our faith? How much longer before the church is literally under attack as it is in other places? The question really for me is, are, are you ready? Um, are you in the Word and walking so closely with God that you believe your faith is strong enough to face death for Him? Uh, none of us know if we'll be asked to do that. And um, I think it would be very boastful to think that, uh-huh, I can stand up for it because none of us really know the, the kind of fear. We pray that God would strengthen us to stand in that moment if that was the case. It reminds me of Shadrach, um, Shadrach and um, I think it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, yeah, Daniel, where um, Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, you don't bow down and worship this image of myself, I'm going to throw you into the fire. And um, they say something to the effect of, uh, you know, our God is able to save us. So, that, so what they do is they say, we're not going to bow down to your statue, and our God is able to save us. But if he decides not to, um, there's no way that we're going to... Um, let me just look it up because it's such a good part and I hate to, I always hate to um, paraphrase and, and give you my um, version filled with errors when, when the Word of God is so good on its own. So of course, um, these three men were Daniel's contemporaries, they were Jewish prisoners, um, Is Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Of course, this is a famous um, story of the three men in the fiery furnace and who uh, accompanies them, the Lord Jesus, 
it was suggests that it was the Lord, um, a pre-incarnate um, visit from the Lord, and not even the smell of smoke was on their clothes. What I love about it is they say, hey, God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, you better believe that we're not going to change our allegiance. We're going to serve him and him and only. That was really <laughs> why my mind went there. So let's press forward. Continue with the martyrs. They cried out with a loud voice. And, you know, to me, the application here is that um, we ought to be able to pour out our heart to God in prayer. Um, there's a lot of neat connection points here. Um, but the, the main application is we can and we can be comforted knowing that he sees and he cares. He, he rewards the, these martyrs with white robes, which symbolize honor and purity and victory. We've seen a lot about these robes throughout Revelation so far. But you know what? The robes really symbolize God's care for them. Uh, he, he recognizes what they've done on his behalf. He recognizes how hard that was for them. And um, he tells them to wait a little longer and rest. Uh, Aiken writes, God's delay does not mean he does not care, or excuse me, not know. It does not mean that he does not care. He knows and he cares. So rest. Justice has been determined and justice will be done. It's a really great, great quote from Aiken's commentary. And then we have this uh, business about until the number is complete. And really that teaches us that God has appointed a fixed number of martyrs that will die for him and the faith before the end comes and he destroys the rebels. Um, the question is why? And I think this is very helpful. This is from Hamilton in his commentary, the Preaching the Word series. He says, Why would God have an appointed number of martyrs who have to be killed before he avenges their blood? And his answer is, I suspect it has something to do with the way the believers, saying that God is better than life and sealing that confession with their life's blood, testifies to the supreme value of knowing God. So it really is a display of his glory that people will willingly show that it's better to serve God and trust him and die than to denounce him and not trust him or rebel against him. It's really powerful. Of course, this picture is a recent picture of um, ISIS uh, committing horrible sins and executing um, God's people. And as hard as it is to think about, we can find comfort that God knows and sees and cares and will avenge. Which brings us to the last section of chapter 6. That was the fifth seal. Really unusual. Uh, instead of like horrible things happening, it's almost like an interlude itself. And we learn something about God's justice and the martyrs. And then the sixth still happens, and it really gets intense. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Wow. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So this is... <clears throat> the wrath of the Lamb. It's judgment that increases in, in incredible intensity when Jesus opens the sixth seal. It's important that we are mindful that all of this is happening under the sovereign control of God. Um, this is His plan. These cosmic events um, serve a purpose, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But there is a question. Some 
scholars think that these descriptions of such incredible cosmic upheaval are only symbolic. And I just don't think that that um, is a very strong argument. Um, the reason is, is that things like the moon turning red and great earthquakes and all these other things um, are referenced all throughout Scripture. Uh, and and we, I have uh, some references listed here for you. But I think it's best to understand these as literal events. And I'll give you an example of one evidence for that in a minute. If you zoom back, the big picture is the end has come. The immediate end of history or this age is here. You know, um, all that scoffing, all that wondering, you know, where's the God of your fathers? Um, well, everybody is going to um, have to face up to, to that when they're shocked by the events that will transpire. It's certainly an unmistakable event. And so what the point here is, is that no one's going to miss this. No one's going to be ignorant of this. No one's going to be in their house and la-di-da miss this happening. Which is really important when Jesus says, don't be deceived by people, false messiahs that come and claim you know, that they're me. Um, don't run to them. Don't follow them. Um, you'll know when it's me. And I think that's the point. Like the whole universe is going to shake when the Lord returns. And that's what I have here at the bottom. Unmistakable event. No one will be ignorant. And it's exactly why false Christ will be obvious. Because obviously their arrival, let's say the Antichrist, is not going to be accompanied by the sky rolling up like a scroll, right? So we see a divine earthquake huge in proportion. Uh, Aiken, I think, uh, mentioned that uh, earthquakes often accompany divine visits. And uh, there's some examples there I put for you. Um, but listen to Zechariah 14.4. And in that day his feet, that's Jesus, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. This is a, a very specific example of, of, of real significant, perhaps violent topological change when the Lord returns. Um, it's more, almost more than we can imagine when we see stars falling from the sky and, and the sky being rolled as a scroll. Um, mountains and islands are all moved. I mean, you can only imagine the, the fear and the severity of this type of event. You know, most of you remember Mount St. Helens exploding. Um, more recently, we had a huge and tragic tsunami, um, killed 200,000 off the Indonesia. Um, you know, remember the earthquake in Haiti, uh, or even some of the horrible things that have happened um, due to hurricanes and um, you know natural disasters, but none of them even come close to what this is describing. And um, I think, you know, I'm comforted because I personally believe that the church will not be here. Um, but in the event that I'm wrong on that particular subject or viewpoint, if God do does allow the church to experience this, I do think He'll provide special grace to strengthen us um, and help us through that. I just want to throw that out there because if certainly um, we can't say conclusively that um, our viewpoint is right. You know, we we think so, and there are a lot of other brothers and sisters who have a different viewpoint re regarding the timing of these things. Uh, but God's grace is sufficient, uh, no matter what no matter which way it happens, correct? I personally hope, as I know you do, that uh, we are called away because no one would want to experience this. 
So um, one of the things that we see here is that when you're, when you're asking yourself why would God allow these things to happen, um, Hamilton argues that it seems very clear that he's displaying his power to provoke repentance so that you know all these people who rejected him might come to believe in him. But sadly, it's not the result, um, is what Hamilton writes. Uh, and, and what we see here is that it doesn't really matter who you are or what type of man-made distinction that, that sets you apart. All of that is leveled when the wrath of the Lamb comes. Um, you think about all the, all the categories that it mentions in the text. It talks about those who are powerful, those who are commanders, those who are wealthy, those uh, even slave or free, which pretty much takes out, takes care of the whole population, includes the whole population on earth. Uh, the point is, is that, you know, even if you're a king, even if you're, uh, you know, high society, even if you're the richest person in the world, even if you're um, noble, a, a army general or commander or, you know, all these things that we find our own self-esteem in will not matter uh, when you face God's comprehensive judgment. They're not going to save you from it. In fact, they'll be trinkets. They'll be worthless when it comes to having to face God and His just judgment. And so what's the application there? Well, at the very bottom you see here uh, another quote from Hamilton. Um, he talks about every form of pride is going to be crushed. And the real question is, would you like your pride crushed on Calvary at the cross? Or would you like your pride crushed at the horror of the wrath of the Lamb? That really is the question that every soul faces. You can die to yourself and your own pride now, this idea of independence and rebellion against God and you know, running after darkness and, and, and living in sin. You can repent of your sin and you can turn to God and submit to Him now through the cross. Or you are going to be humbled and your pride will be dealt with in a much different way. And that is you will face the wrath of the Lamb yourself. And we see this. We see the unrepentant flee in terror. And it's, it's, just, it's just horrible, right? It's sad. They're, they're asking that even the mountains would fall on them. I mean, you know, that is not um, a very lighthearted uh, way to ask to be, um, to die. Yet they're willing to go through that instead of facing the wrath of the Lamb. I mean, that just shows you how terrific, in the old sense of the word, full of terror, this, this really is. And I don't think we have to think about it too long before we, we realize the sense of, um, you know, people, people on earth get traumatized by violence and war and all types of things. This is exponentially a whole nother level of, of horror. Um, I think that's a wonderful motivator for loving and sharing the gospel and having gospel-centered conversations because the truth is that unless people confess the Lord Jesus, um, this is their future. Now, what strikes me when you talk about this is that if all of this happening a declaration of God's supreme sovereign power and might is to provoke repentance. Over and over in Revelation, we read that they don't repent. In fact, you can see that pattern in chapter 9 and chapter 16. It literally says, but they do not repent. You know, it's like God's given them an opportunity and they refuse. And it reminds me of... Uh, Lazarus, who was sent to hell and begged for a touch of water on his tongue, and uh, then he begged to go be able to go visit his five brothers and tell them about the reality of hell. And God answered him and said, if, if they don't believe the law and the prophets, they're not even going to believe you. 
which is the Bible, right? If they don't believe the Old Testament, God says if they don't believe the Word of God, they're not even going to believe you when you come and visit them from hell. Um, and so when people reject God now, when they reject the gospel, when they reject Jesus, or even evidence of his glory from creation or the conscience, the law of God written on their heart, um, it's not going to be any different, even when he is here in great wrath and, and terrific power. Um, I think when we step back and we, we try to take all this in, uh, it, it is very emotive and uh, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. But the, the biggest idea of this whole chapter is that it's happened. It's come. The time is up. Um, you know, we were, we were on a countdown clock and the last second has happened. The great day of his wrath has come. Uh, what Joe calls the day of the Lord Oftentimes, sometimes in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is used to refer to a, uh, an Old Testament event. But in Joel, the case can be made that it actually has a double fulfillment. And while it might mean some events in the Old Testament, it also is pointing to the, the ultimate day of the Lord, the final eschatological event of, um, of judgment. And of course, I think we've got the point. No one can withstand it. Um, the great tribulation has arrived. Jeremiah 37 uh, calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. It says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And so that uh, um, has an interesting uh, promise of uh, encouragement there at the end. Uh, but this time of Jacob's trouble is the, the, the tribulation. It's also um, Daniel's 70th week, which I hope we'll have time to, to, to kind of think through in a later study. But you can read up on it um, if you're interested. All right, so I wanted to share with you um, some principles and applications from Kenneth Easley. Um, I think they're very valuable. We're, we're, we're thinking about chapter 6, as a whole. Here we go. Um, one is the history of the world inevitably includes conquest, warfare, famine, and death. We know that's where it's headed. It's not headed to this perfect utopia. Two, the number of Christian martyrs will continue or increase in number until the return of Christ, um, until the last appointed martyr has been killed for their faith in the Lord. Next, God will avenge the death of the martyrs at the right time and give them special honor. Um, you know, the type of awards that God uh, gives out um, are incredible. Authority over cities, uh, co-ruling with Him. Um, I guarantee you they're going to be uh, celebrated amongst us uh, for that special honor. Uh, next, whenever the forces of nature run amok, the natural human response is to protect self and to blame God. I questioned this a little bit. Um, I see where he's coming from. Um, yes, I see that all the time as a pastor. Bad things happen. Instead of going to God for help, people shake their fist at God. Um, they totally ignore the fact that you know sin is coming to the world because of human rebellion um, and that sometimes bad things happen as a result of consequences for sinful acts. Um, but his point is, is, when you look at it, when, when, when these folks have an opportunity to repent in this horrible day of judgment, they refuse. And uh, for that reason, I decided to leave this comment in there. Um, last, in, in terms of principles, the wrath of God against sin cannot be ignored. It, it should not be ignored in history, like now, and it's certainly not going to be ignored at the end of history. Which is why your, uh, your pastors that are crying out like a voice in the wilderness, preaching on the justice and the wrath and the judgment of God, a very unpopular message in a lost world, um, you should really praise the Lord for them because they are teaching you the truth 
because they care enough about you. If you are in a church and you have a pastor that never talks about these things and never talks about sin, never talks about um, the, the penalty of sin, then I would encourage you to have a conversation with him or pray about finding another church where you can hear the full counsel of the Word of God preached. Otherwise, uh, people are misleading the flock uh, that they're charged to be over if they don't um, teach about the, the consequences that are coming for sin. All right, here's the applications. Thank God that he sets limits on the damage that humanly caused conquest, warfare, famine, and death bring. And the next one is limits on the damage of natural disasters. I think his idea is here is, wow, we experience some pretty difficult things on earth right now. However, thank the Lord that in his grace he limits the scope of some of those things because we know what's going to be coming one day. Uh, and it is going to blow all these others uh, out of the water in comparison. Finally, pray for those who are facing martyrdom as Christians. Um, certainly, I, I believe that that is so important. Uh, there's a lot of great ministries out there that uh, are all about uh, ministering to those and bringing attention to those who are dying for the faith and uh, getting help to these people groups that are suffering so much persecution. Um, you can look into that, and um, Voice of the Martyrs is, is the one that I really think of. Finally, be faithful to Christ unto death, whatever kind of death God permits to come to you. In a real sense, our, all of our faith is going to be challenged as we face our death, if we have the opportunity to know it's coming, right? Um, what's so important is that in what, whatever way God has designed for us to meet death, we need to be trusting implicitly, completely, on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the one thing that should be on our heart, because that is the way that we will receive eternal life in the presence of our Father. It will be because of the shed blood of Jesus. It will be because of His righteousness. That is where our faith has to be uh, welded to. And um, I think God's grace is sufficient even then in the moments of death. All right, well, wow, a lot of material. Uh, we talked about some of the chronology of the tribulation and of Revelation itself. We talked about the martyrs and uh, verses um, 9 through 11, and then uh, the fifth seal. And then we, we also talked about the sixth seal, which is tremendous in scope. I hope that you're blessed today. I hope that um, that you're learning and that you are enjoying this time in God's Word. I ask that you would go ahead and read through chapter 7. I hope that we'll be able to get through that entire chapter next week. Well, until then, uh, I just pray that you and your family will be blessed. Um, I want to thank you again for your time and attention. And I just uh, pray that God would um, help you grow closer to Him. Until next time, have a good day. God bless you. Bye-bye.